So this tutorial video is going to go through how to calculate the continuum tortuosity value for uh, a given material. So there is also the ability to calculate a rarefied tortuosity using a particle-based method. Um, I will introduce the particle-based method, but I'm not going to talk too much about the rarefied tortuosity, just because it's a bit beyond the scope of what can really be well explained in a tutorial video like this. Um, the rarefied tortuosity is explained a little bit in the Software X paper that we published that you can see here on the screen, uh, just Puma, the porous microstructure analysis software. Um, it's also explained in full detail in a uh, journal publication that we are currently, it's currently under review. Um, if that paper is not out yet, uh, then you can just reach out to me at joseph.fergusonstanford.edu and I can share with you an advanced copy of that manuscript while it's under review if you are interested in doing calculations in the rarefied regime. Now, um, for the continuum tortuosity, which of course is just a, uh, a, a measure of how much a material resists diffusion, uh, we can calculate this quite simply in the Puma GUI. So if you open up a terminal, type in um, uh, type in conda activate Puma, and then type in Puma GUI dot sh. Uh, then the Puma GUI will launch. You can obviously run this on a tomography sample if you want. Um, for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to run on a randomly generated spherical structure. I'm going to generate it to be quite small, just 128 cubed um, with an average radius of 10 and a porosity of 0.8. There's a separate video that goes through the random sphere generation in a little bit more detail if you want to go watch that. But um, as we go through in that video, the uh, void phase will be stored between uh, 0 to 127, and the solid phase will be stored between 128 and 255 in the grayscale values. So if you generate a contour of this, then here you go. You can see the material that we've just generated. Now, um, the tortuosity, as I mentioned before, is a material's resistance to diffusion. And as you can see with a material like this that is quite porous, it's unlikely that it has a very high tortuosity value. So a tortuosity of value of one would be no resistance whatsoever. A tortuosity value of two would essentially be it uh, is like a 50% impediment on the tortuosity. So um, I'm sorry, on the diffusion. So we would expect this material to maybe have a tortuosity of 1.15 or, or 1.2 or something like that. Well, let's go ahead and calculate it. And we'll calculate it using both um, uh, the continuum solver and we'll also calculate it using uh, the particle solver. So first thing we're gonna do is open up material properties and then uh, tortuosity and let's say tortuosity continuum. And uh, the first thing that you'll find here is what solver method you want to use. So there are two different solvers. There's the explicit jump solver, which um, is uh, from, it is a finite difference method that uses FFTs to, uh, to accelerate the solution. It was published by um, Wegman, and um, the citation for that you can find in the SoftwareX paper if you want to go read his paper on this. And uh, it does a very, very good job of very quickly converging to, uh, to steady state so that we can calculate the, um, the, the diffusive flux. Now the limitation of this method in our implementation of it is that we only have periodic boundary conditions. So if that doesn't work for you, then you can also go to our finite volume method. You can select uh, the iterative solver that you want to use, and you can also select the boundary conditions to be either symmetric or periodic in the uh, non-simulation direction. So let's start with the explicit jump solver though. Explicit jump using periodic boundary conditions. The grayscale range of the void phase has to be specified. So by void phase, I just mean the, the phase that the air will be diffusing through. In the case of this generated material, zero to 127 is the phase we wanna use. Um, if you were using a tomography sample, this would of course be different. Um, and it would be different for each tomography sample that you use. Now. Solver directions, 
are calculating the tortuosity in which directions. So if you select them all, then we're going to calculate the tortuosity in all three directions. Accuracy is just a measure of when the iterative solver is going to say, okay, it's good enough. We've reached steady state. Um, typically one e to the minus four is what we use, but you can, you can make it more accurate if you, if you would like. Uh, iterations is the maximum number of iterations before the solver is going to give up. And the number of CPUs is how many processors you want to use uh, for the parallelization. So since I'm just running this on a MacBook, there are only four processors to begin with. Um, if you're running it on a high-end workstation, you may have a lot more than that to deal with. Uh, if you put this to zero, it will ask uh, OpenMP what the maximum number of processors that we can use is. In this case, it'll be four, and it'll just use whatever that default value is. So typically, we're just going to leave this to be zero, and it's going to use the maximum number of processors. So if we begin calculation, here we go. You can see that since we're running on a pretty small sample, it's converging uh, very quickly. And you can see now our tortuosity values here um, in uh, uh, are 1.14, 1.13, and 1.16 in the X, Y, and Z directions. So that's roughly what we would expect given the fact that this should be a, uh, an isotropic material. Uh, we're going to do the same calculation using the finite volume solver uh, with the conjugate gradient method, 0 to 127, same accuracy, same solver directions, uh, iterations, uh, 10,000. Um, this should result in an almost identical uh, solution. The only difference will be in the boundary condition in the, simula in the simulation direction. Uh, the finite volume uh, solver defaults to a Dirichlet boundary condition in the simulation direction rather than periodic. So if we begin calculation on this, now I should note that this uh, simulation will take uh, quite a bit longer to converge than the explicit jump, but it, it should still be fairly fast. There we go, the X direction is finished. Now we've moved on to simulating in the Y direction. And I should just clarify what I mean by that. The way that this solver works is that we impose a pressure gradient in one direction. So we'll just impose, for example, I'm sorry, a concentration gradient in one direction. So we'll impose, for example, in the X direction, a concentration gradient of here, zero on one side, concentration gradient of one, uh, or concentration value of zero and a concentration value of one on this side and then the solver will converge the concentration field to steady state. And once it's done that, you can calculate the steady state mass flow, um, uh, the, the diffusion flux, and then from the diffusive flux, you can calculate the uh, tortuosity value. So the Y direction just finished and now we're in the Z direction. While this is running, uh, maybe I'll just make a quick note about representative elementary volumes. Um, since we're running here on a very, very, very small domain of you know something like a 128 cubed, uh, this is definitely not a representative volume. Um, representative volume, what I mean is that if you were to say generate the same material again with a different, uh, a, a different random seed or if you were using tomography, if you were to run it again with a different tomography image, that you would end up with uh, the exact same value within you know, plus or minus a percent or, or something like that, whatever your threshold is, which is a little bit arbitrary. We define that as a representative volume. So here we go, the simulation finished, and you can see we have, again, 1.13, 1.13, 1.15, 1 so basically the same thing as, as we were getting before. Okay, so moving on to material properties, tortuosity, random walk tortuosity. So the random walk tortuosity is going to use, instead of, um, instead of 
using a continuum based solver like finite difference or finite volume, we're going to use particles instead. So we're going to populate the domain with a bunch of particles and then we're going to diffuse those particles and uh, for a certain amount of time and then see how far the particles diffused. And based on how far the particles diffused, we can then back out what the tortuosity is. So similarly to before, we're going to say a grayscale range of 0 to 127. Um, we're going to specify, sure, 10,000 particles is fine. Uh, total walk length of 10,000 is fine. Now, mean free path here is, is important. So mean free path, and this is going to be in voxels, is the average distance that the particle travels before it assumes statistically that it's had a particle-particle collision, and then it'll change directions. So if this value is set to be low, and one here is, is reasonably low, then it's going to be in the continuum. If this value is set to be very high, then you're going to end up with rarefied diffusion. So rarefied diffusion here is a little bit outside of the scope of uh, what we're going to talk about. As I mentioned before, you can reference the upcoming paper or send me an email if you're interested in doing rarefied diffusion. For continuum diffusion, we're going to leave this value low. Mean thermal velocity um, is actually not terribly relevant for this uh, calculation in the continuum since this is going to be uh, in the end, it'll it'll average out. So it this will increase the velocity of the particles, but then it'll be divided out in the end when we're calculating what the tortuosity is. Random seed, uh, you know, can be anything you want. Um, you typically, though, want to use a repeated random seed if you're trying to debug a, a simulation or something. Number of threads, once again, zero defaults to the maximum. So we'll just leave it at that. Now, this is quite important. This is whether you want the particles to collide with either the voxel surface or with the triangulated surface. So the triangulated surface is going to give you a better representation of the uh, actual surface based on the, the microtomography. Um, the cubrile or voxel surface is actually going to give you, it should, if you use enough particles for enough of a walk length, it'll give you the exact same solution as the continuum methods did. Um, the isosurface will probably give a slightly different answer since it's a higher order representation of the surface. This Newton tortuosity method, don't worry too much about this if you're just running a continuum simulation. If you're running a continuum simulation, change this to be variable. And now we're going to say begin calculation and wait, and hopefully it'll be reasonably quick. you look at the terminal that you're running on, you can see exactly what step is occurring. So right now it's uh, generating the random walks or it's executing the random walks. Uh, it will plot this plot of mean square displacement as a function of time. Um, the fact that this is linear here is good. That's, that's what we want to see. It's also plotting the mean square displacement for each direction. So since this is an isotropic material, we expect the lines to be more or less on top of each other. And we can see that that is, in fact, what's happening. If this was not an isotropic material, we would expect to see the lines diverging from one another. And here we go, we can see that now we have an effective tortuosity value of 1.107, 1 uh, 1.09, 1 1.13. Now, if you notice, these are slightly different, although still fairly close to the tortuosity values that we had in the other solvers. Uh, there are two reasons for that. The first is going to be the surface representation of using an ISO surface is actually a, a more accurate representation of the surface. So if it's between the two, I would trust this random walk method uh, more than the continuum solver. And second is the um, 
the fact that we're dealing with a very, very small sample size here. So if you were to run this on a much larger sample size, um, that is, you know, a representative volume, then the differences between the two methods would kind of average out and you would expect to see, uh, you would expect to see values that are very, very close to each other. And that's pretty much it for this simulation. Um, if you have any questions, if anything here did not make sense to you, um, if it's not clear in the paper or the, uh, or the documentation either, please reach out to me at joseph.ferguson at stanford.edu.